All Things Unexplained, hosted by Dr. Mounts. Let's face it, we were always ready to roll without him anyway. <laughs> CJ Derringer. Ain't nobody perfect, right? And Smitty Neves. I've never planned out hardly anything my whole life. I just free ball. Featuring Cajun Man. I'm just old nobody, somebody looking for somebody. Welcome, everybody, to the first NAP conference on cryptozoology, brought to you by Corn WingCon. I'm so excited to be here. So excited to have these panelists here. My name is Dr. Mounts. I am an author, a podcaster, a professor. I'd like to tell everybody what our objective is here tonight with the first NAP conference on cryptozoology. Our objective is this, from television shows to festivals to books and everywhere in between, cryptozoology has never been a more popular cultural phenomenon than right now. Our objective with this first NAP conference on cryptozoology is to address outstanding, preeminent, open questions in the emerging scientific field of cryptozoology. I'd like to ask our listeners to be thinking about something and start commenting here. In one word, what comes to mind, and I'll get our panelist interpretation of this momentarily. In one word, listeners, what comes to mind when some you hear someone say cryptozoology? In one word, what comes to mind when you hear someone say cryptozoology? The panelist and I were actually talking about this briefly before we went live. But now I'd like to welcome our panelists. First off, I have an award-winning horror writer and musician. His newest book is called Razor's Edge. It is an origin story of one Freddy Krueger. I believe I've got that right. He's also the author of Fathom, a Loch Ness monster story. I'd like to welcome to the panel of experts tonight, Blake Best. Blake, welcome. Thank you for having me. That was an amazing little introduction. I could, I could just have you do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, did I get that right about Razor's Edge? Is that a, a Freddy Krueger origin story? It, it is. This is the second time it came out. That book has the unique distinction of being one of the most expensive books on Amazon. I had a fan uh, send me a message about a year or two ago, and I went on there to look, and it's selling for $2,000 a copy, and I don't even own one, and I wrote it. So I was like, you find it, jump on it, my friend, because I sure don't have one. Uh, <laughs> but I put it out again. I've, I've got it here with a new cover. So I actually think it's a, the, the cover art's a lot more interesting, you know? So. Oh, I love it. I love it. I Great. So oh, yeah. I will... I have a personal connection with Nightmare on Elm Street. Number one, besides it being one of the most terrifying things I ever saw in my childhood, but two, my first cousin who lived in a small town in Mississippi with me, he now he had it much worse than I did. He actually lived on Elm Street in my small town. <laughs> and as, a, as a young child, when Nightmare on Elm Street 1 came out, so... Not good for him. <laughs> Blake, can you give us a, a synopsis of Fathom, your Loch Ness Monster book? Oh, sure, sure. Uh, first, I've got the, the book here. Just, this is not a shameless plug, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> I like it, though. I just thought I would just show it off. So, oh, I do, too. And, the, and it's the same artist that designed the cover for Razor's Edge. So I'm like... I think I'm just going to hang on to him, you know? So, uh, uh, <laughs> so Fathom is a fictional book and it's a horror novel. So 
the Loch Ness monster itself is more of a horror-based figure in this uh, in this book. So the book centers around Jack Warner. He's a cryptozoologist, and for those of you that don't know what that is, that is a cryptozoology is the study of animals that are unknown or shouldn't exist, but some think they do. So it's it's like Dr. Mount said, it's it's slowly reemerging to the forefront as um, a part of a uh, culture, you know, and it's become something a lot of people are studying again. So um, Jack Warner's a cryptozoologist, and he's the writer of Keeper of the Lock, which is a book that he wrote on the Loch Ness Monster. So he's offered a job by a paranormal investigator named Chris McDonald. So he's going back to the lake, and he wants to spend, you know, money's no option. He wants to spend everything he can to prove definitively that there is a creature in Loch Ness, and it's of unknown origin. So he's touted this investigation as the end-all, be-all. This is the investigation of all investigations, you know. And that's why he's always uh, specific and, and uh, you know, about the money not being an issue. So Jack finds himself in the in the lock, uh, you know, on this expedition. But is he going to be ready for what he finds? You know, is, is, is perfect for any of them going to be ready? Uh, and that's an important question because once you read the book, you'll find out exactly what the Loch Ness Monster is and whether or not they're ready for it or not. Oh, yeah, it sounds amazing. I can't wait to check it out. I have been to Loch Ness and in Vernus. It is an incredible place, an incredible creature, and an amazing legend. Thanks, Blake. So I'd also like to welcome our next panelist to the show, this young lady is also an award-winning author, columnist, and speaker. She is the author of the Bigfoot Lives in Idaho series. Some amazing things about her. She has 10 children, 9 grandchildren, an assortment of chickens and cats, and she much prefers to live life outside Please welcome none other than Becky Cook Armstrong. Welcome, Becky. <laughs> and, I, and honestly, I don't know which of those facts is the most impressive. <laughs> did you forgot to mention how tall I am? <laughs> I I did not mention that. So so Becky is is a is a wondrous woman why don't you tell everybody exactly how tall you are becky so i am six foot six and that puts me in the top 100 women for the united states and the top 200 people for the world top 200 women for the world and of course you know i'll probably get passed up by the younger generation as they feed them more and <laughs> stretch them more <laughs> feed them more vegetables whatever <laughs> But it puts me in the same, you know, the same market as the Bigfoot. You know, you can't find shoes very easily. <laughs> <laughs> so, Be <laughs> Becky and I have talked before, and it did come up about the feet because our talk was on specifically Bigfoot and Bigfoot living in Idaho. And we never did ask exactly uh, what your shoe size is, Becky, but I kind of feel inclined to now. <laughs> I wear size 14 in women's, if you can find them. <laughs> Holy cow. So, Becky, <laughs> that's that's amazing. What what word do, comes to your mind when you hear someone say cryptozoology? <laughs> that, I feel like that's like the catch-all terminology for, for everything that's unexplained that people see and experience. I would even say like things like fairies. You could put fairies in that terminology just because people don't know what they're looking at or experiencing when they when they see them. But, you know, <laughs> the right. dragons and the griffins and the Loch Ness. Oh, for sure. And Blake, some of what she said crossed over into mythology. Blake, do you, do you see a blend in mythology and cryptozoology, do, do these things cross over? Well, yeah, there's a blend. I mean, certainly, um, like Becky said, a lot of people kind of classify cryptozoology as almost like a, 
I want to say like a receptacle, but like, okay, I don't know what it is I'm looking at. So because I don't know what it is and I can't ask somebody and I don't have my phone on me to try to look up what it is, I'm going to toss it over here into this receptacle that says cryptozoology. But um, honestly, it is, yep. the mythology part of it to me is the exciting, you know, it's the exciting part. It's, uh, you know, the basis for whatever it is you're talking about, like the basis for Bigfoot or the Abominable Snowman or the Yeti or, you know, uh, the Pangbachi Hand or, or any of the stuff like that. Um, it's, it's all rooted in reality somewhere, even if it's just a tiny bit. But it becomes almost mythological and legendary as the stories are passed down from generation to generation. Oftentimes, it's used as something to bring people together. There's always We've always had that uncle, that grandfather, that father-in-law, that best friend's father, or even the best friend, maybe, that told these really awesome stories about, you know, something he saw in the woods, and he really wasn't sure what it was, but he saw it, and he'll never forget the way it looked, or she'll never forget seeing the eyes in between the trees, or, you know, there's these stories, so yeah. it's almost become like, a, like, just a part of our rite of passage as humans, is the legacy of storytelling and mythology and I think that, that the cryptozoology element, mixing those two together, is is not a bad idea. I think that it would open a lot of people's minds to want to investigate these things a little bit further. Even like what Becky said, like, you know, the Cottingley fairy photographs. You know, though we know some of those were were hoaxed, or, you know, the surgeon's photograph of the Loch Ness Monster. We know that one was hoaxed, but we didn't find out until 60 years later so by that point it had already become ingrained in our collective consciousness this is what i think of when i see the bigfoot this is what i think of when i see the Ness monster this is what i think of when i see fairies you know so it becomes part of part of who we are so absolutely that's the very long-winded answer to your question dr Mel. <laughs> no that's <laughs> that's don't be sorry that's a terrific answer and you know it makes me think becky you have a lot of experience with the native americans in the idaho and, and that region there what what how do you think they look at cryptozoology to be continued